Hello and good afternoon. This is Beth Galvin, uh, the Fox Medical Team reporter, and I am live in our digital newsroom talking to Dr. Taz. She is a specialist in all kinds of holistic and integrative medicine. She's also a medical doctor. And we're gonna be talking this afternoon about how to stay healthy on a budget this summer. We're gonna be answering some of your summer questions, both on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. Um, so we really wanna hear from you and weigh in on this chat and, and get some of the questions that you would love to have answered by Dr. Taz. As I said, she knows really everything about kind of how to keep yourself well, how to you know, prevent yourself from getting sick in the long run so you don't end up in the doctor's office, but also tips on saving money, um, on eating organic, on you know, how, to, how to get healthier in a budget, and I'm thrilled to have you. Thank you. Uh, I feel like I'm talking yes. too much, but <laughs> no, uh, welcome no, no. Dr. Taz. And you said you, know, you get all kinds of questions. Right before um, we went live, Katie, Katie Beasley in my ear, who has um, a young daughter, yeah. said, I want to talk about sunblock and sunscreen for babies. So why don't we start there? That's a great place to start. It's summertime and a lot of us are headed to the beach, but mm -hmm. with babies, it gets a little bit tricky. Honestly, you don't want to use sunscreen if they okay. are under six months of age. Okay. If they're older than six months, it's okay to use sunscreen, but that's where we also start worrying about chemicals and toxins. Mm -hmm. So one of the safest sunscreens is just zinc, using zinc oxide, which okay. you can get over the counter. And lather your babies up in that if they're six months or older. And for all babies, keep them out of the sun. I know we hate it when we're making those beach trips, but they really need to be covered. They need a hat. They need the shade. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're in a stroller, have the stroller shade on them. If you're out at the beach, have a tent over them. Mm -hmm. But they really don't need the sun exposure. And maybe talking a little bit about that babies in the heat. I mean, what do you have to be careful for? What do you have to watch for? How should you be dressing babies right now? Because it's high 90s. Right. It's pretty beastly it's hot, hot out there. It's yeah. very hot. So, you know, babies have, they're tiny, right? They have a large surface area. They've got all the skin to cover and they're mm -hmm. really tiny. So they're going to lose heat really quickly. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep them out of the heat in those peak hours, especially between like 12 and four. Mm -hmm. Really, they should be out of the heat. If you're at the beach, you should be bringing them in around that time. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you know, keep them covered like we talk, talked about. And when you take them out, I would have them, you know, covered in very light colored clothes, mm -hmm. you know, maybe down to their wrist or even have their legs covered as well, which is counterintuitive. Most of us, you know, wear less clothes, especially with our children when they're dressed in shorts or three right. little dresses or things like that. But I would say keep them covered. It's a layer of protection from the sun mm -hmm. and keep them out of the sun, especially in those peak hours. And what about, um, you see kids with, um, with um, sunshades on and you know yeah. I is that a good idea should they be wearing sunglasses do you think when they're out there in the sun or well the sun the sunglasses are for eye health you know okay. I mean that, that is going to protect their eyes to a certain extent but yeah. again you know if you're going to if you want to think about getting a lot of gear to be out in the sun mm -hmm. you know you can sunglasses will help shades will help all of that helps it's additive it's cumulative mm -hmm. but at the end of the day we really want them out of the sun in those peak hours okay so we're talking with Dr. Taz from Center Spring Medicine we're going to be um, answering your Facebook questions if you want to go ahead and post them on the Fox 5 Atlanta Facebook page. Um, I got one from Marcina Presley earlier and okay. she said she really wants to know what are going to be the best fruits this summer. What do you think is you know in-season, healthy, affordable? What should people be shopping for? Well, you know, your best bet to saving money when you're trying to get out there and buy healthy fruits and vegetables is first of all, determine what is grown locally. So Georgia peaches, right? Yeah, those are going to be yeah, the yeah. cheapest. They're going to be available. Why mm -hmm. not get those? So mm -hmm. those are one of the key crops. Then you also want to look at things that are in season that are typically grown in the summertime. So, you know, look at things like strawberries, apple, well, not apples, actually, strawberries, nectarines, mm -hmm. you know, cherries. That This is the season for some of those fruits. So typically they're going to be cheaper this time of the year versus the fall or the winter. Mm -hmm. You know, things like apples, their season is usually in the fall, so they're going to be a little bit more expensive. So I would say look for things that are local, locally sourced. Look for fruits and vegetables that are in season. Those are going to be cheaper and they're going to be more available. And honestly, they're going to be fresher because they haven't sat on a truck, you know, and come over a couple of months of time to your grocery store. And do you use your farmer's market? I do use the farmer's market. You know, I don't use it nearly as much as I would like to. There are a lot of local markets, you mm -hmm. know, that are in neighborhoods. And then here in Atlanta, we have some amazing big farmer's markets mm -hmm. that even I used to go to as a child. My, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a weekend trip, so to speak, to go to the farmer's market. 
but um, I, I love them. You have a lot of fresh produce there. And again, they're reasonably priced most of the time, you know? So yeah. yes, I highly recommend using them. Again, it's usually you have to go on a Saturday morning. If it's a local farmer's market, some of the bigger ones are open all throughout the week. And you know, we talked to, we're gonna be looking for some of your questions here, um, but we, um, you know, we talk about fruits and vegetables and talk about shopping organic. Um, one question that I have is, where do you put your money when you talk about shopping organic? You know, I get asked that all the time. And, you know, people always say it's so expensive to eat healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear that all the time. You know, this is what I really noticed. When you we're shopping and trying to eat healthy, what usually happens is we buy too much. You know, that's the first thing that happens. So that yeah. beautiful box of spinach by day three is a watery mess and you never had an opportunity, opportunity to use it. Right. So the first thing with shopping healthy is to really just kind of budget and proportion how much you're really going to consume. I mean, that's one thing my husband came down on on me because I'm like <laughs> buying everything. <laughs> <laughs> and we're dumping it out midweek. Yeah. So, you know, we're really just trying to understand how much as a family or as a person you really consume. So that's the first key. So okay. buy less, okay. you know, make sure you're buying what you really need. Mm -hmm. And then when you're shopping organic, remember, you know, the Dirty Dozen, the Clean 15. We mm -hmm. talk about those a lot of the time. If and you talk about those if you can, because I'm not sure everybody's really familiar yeah, with those. Yeah, so the Environmental Working Group, which is an amazing resource, if you guys have access to that. I mean, just go online. It's ewg.org. But it really rates fruit vegetables, mm -hmm. you know, produce, and really talks about what the toxic load is mm -hmm. of each of these different crops. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that there are certain fruits and vegetables that are dirtier when they're not organic mm -hmm. than others, meaning they have a lot more pesticide use. You have to use a lot more, you know, different types of ingredients, I mean, different types of pesticides to control them and to produce the crop. So those are the dirty dozen. And some of the things on the dirty dozen that you really should buy organic whenever you can include, you know, you want to include strawberries, you want to mm -hmm. include nectarines, cherries, mm -hmm. um, all celery, all of those are on the Dirty Dozen and there's a complete list on the EWG site. The Clean 15 are fruits and vegetables that you don't necessarily need to waste the money buying organic. So, so what are some good examples so of that? So the Clean 15, for example, you'll have um, some of the things on the Clean 15 include like cantaloupe, you know, mm -hmm. bananas, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need to buy organic bananas, you know, oranges or citrus fruits, they don't necessarily need to be organic. So those are a few of the examples there. Okay, so again, we're chatting live with uh, Dr. Taz from Center Spring MD, and I have some of your questions here. I keep looking at my phone because your questions are popping up. But um, Rich Kent says, how can I get healthy um, um, because I have no time to work out and I'm an old truck driver. <laughs> I love that. I love you. <laughs> All right. So his, what's his name? Rich. Mr. Okay. So Rich, um, it's 80% food. It's 20% working out. I keep okay. saying that over and over again. Mm -hmm. So if you can really manage your food, you are almost there. So, okay. I mean, I would really think about the pattern of eating, when you eat, try not to eat really late. Those are some simple things that all of us can do, you know, to stay healthy. And, and Rick's situation is kind of classic because he's on the road probably a lot as a truck driver. Yes. How do you eat well when you're on the road? Because that, a lot of people are going to be on the road for the summer. Right. And that is such a trick because when you're on the road, sometimes there's no access to healthy food for mm -hmm. a long period of time. You know, one of the things I would recommend if it's possible is to plan your food, you know, really think about how long you're going to be gone, take some healthy snacks with mm -hmm, you. Mm -hmm. But then let's say, you know, you've, you've run out of those snacks as well and you've got to pull into the local, you know, restaurant or fast food joint, really evaluate their menu. You know, nowadays menus have calorie counts, mm -hmm. they have salt counts, really look at those things and try to choose healthier options there. Choose a salad over a sandwich, choose a lower salt option over a high salt option, you know, ask for things like dressings and condiments and stuff like that on the side so you can control how much of that is added into your meal so mm -hmm. you can really kind of comb that menu and pick the healthiest option even at the most fast food convenience place that's out there. <laughs> even at the even at the gas station, they still yeah. have healthy options nowadays. And so. they're getting, it seems like they're getting yes. better and better. Yes, so yes, thank yes. you, Rich yeah. Kemp, for your question. Um, and then Debbie R. Cochran says, what is the best way to eat when you're on chemo and radiation? Oh, wow. So that is a loaded question because everybody on chemo and radiation has some different nutritional needs mm -hmm. but if I had to generalize it one of the biggest things that happens with chemo and radiation is that you have a complete loss of appetite you really don't want to eat so what I universally tell those patients is that try to have at least two or three different sources of protein that mm -hmm. you can include in your day mm -hmm. and it may be a protein shake that you force yourself to eat you know pick your favorite product you know maybe you like chocolate maybe you like strawberry or a vanilla flavored protein 
protein powder, mm -hmm. whatever it is, maybe have two or three of them at home, and I would do one or two of those a day because the biggest thing I've seen with chemo and radiation is that um, you're, you know you typically have no appetite, you have no desire to eat, so that's a way to force you to get some basic nutrients in. You know, another dish that you know you may laugh a little bit. It was in the belly fix, but. It is such a wonderful food for anyone fighting an illness or not feeling like eating. It's an Ayurvedic dish, it's called kitchari, and it's you know been handed down for generations in Indian culture, but there has a medicinal value to it. The whole thought was that when you take the rice and you take the lentils and you take some healthy fat like ghee or coconut oil and mm -hmm. you put all that together and you let it cook for a period of time, mm -hmm. then you're getting some protein, you're getting some carbohydrates, and it's very easy for the belly to handle. So it's like a comfort food mm -hmm. that's not entirely junky. So that's another one that she may want to try, and there's some great recipes for that you know, all throughout the internet and in some of our resources as well. So I would say have a protein shake on hand, have, um, have something like kitchari on hand, eat foods that are comforting, but stay away from high sugar foods if you can. That is the number one grower of cancer, and you want to try to stay away from that even while you're undergoing chemo and radiation, and that's tough, so any I, foods I feel for, for um, Any foods for nausea? or anything that's really helpful for nausea that people might not be thinking about besides, you know, prescription medication? Yes, definitely. So nausea, remember, you know, if your whole system's being disrupted while, you know, while you're undergoing chemo and radiation. So ginger, you know, ginger is one of the oldest nausea mm -hmm. remedies that are out there. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do it in so many different ways. You know, I've had people that just slice the ginger and put it directly in their mouth, or they make a ginger tea where they boil some ginger and some hot water together, add mm -hmm. a little bit of honey on into that, and sip that throughout the day. You can make a ginger lemonade. I think that you know is appealing to a lot of people that have some ongoing nausea where mm -hmm. you take the juice of like maybe one or two lemons you can cut up a ginger you know half um, half a ginger root put it into that water fill up the canister of water add some honey into that stir it up really well and just sip on that throughout the day and sometimes that will control nausea as well okay that is a good idea um, um so our questions are kind of all over the place but <laughs> jessica wilson tau says um what can i put on my kids heat rash arriving home um anything at home or is there anything inexpensive for relief oh yeah so I've dealt with this one. I completely understand my two kids are breaking out a little bit too with the heat in summer camps. One of my favorite remedies for heat rash is actually very cheap and very inexpensive, aloe vera. You can get that at your farmer's market. You can grow it yourself. You know, simply cut a leaf of aloe vera, open it up and spread that nicely on your children's um, heat rash. And that's very soothing to them. And it often helps it to go away in about a day or so. Let's say you don't want to take the time and effort to go hunt down aloe vera. You don't have it just growing in your backyard for some reason. Mm -hmm. Then you can use yogurt, you know, just plain off the shelf yogurt at the grocery store. You know, open up a can of yogurt, put a little bit of plain yogurt directly on that heat rash. And that's also very cooling and soothing and helps everything from just a contact heat to the prickly heat that looks so angry and red sometimes. Ah, okay. And there's somebody else is asking something very similar. You know, yeah. what's the best, this is um, Danielle Pertle. She's asking, what's the best for diaper rash? Is it the same or is it that it's different. a little bit different. So I'm assuming they're talking about a, your, um, who's Miss Deborah? Uh, Danielle. Miss Danielle. So Miss Danielle, I'm assuming you're talking about just a regular diaper rash, not necessarily a heat-based diaper rash. If it's just a regular diaper rash that we're worried about, I like zinc oxide mixed with a little bit of coconut oil. Mix those two things together. They're both over the counter. Coat the entire diaper area in that, especially the folds, and oftentimes that will relieve a diaper rash. Okay. If, if you do think it's heat based, you can add aloe vera into that as well. You can okay. add aloe vera into that mixture. And when you talk about coconut oil, we're seeing that more and more mm -hmm. on shelves. What kind of stuff can you use that for in the summertime besides maybe making up a mixture for a diaper rash? Coconut oil is such a multi purpose oil. I can't. You know, if I, I can give you about 50 different things we can use it for. I could keep you here all day just talking about coconut oil. But externally, let's maybe start there. It's a conditioner. You can use it in your hair. One of the things my mom used to make us do is put coconut oil in our hair before we went swimming because mm -hmm. it would condition the hair and seal the cuticle so your hair wouldn't dry out as much. Mm -hmm. It's a moisturizer, so you can use it as a facial moisturizer. Mm -hmm. It treats yeast. So one of the problems in summertime with the heat is that you'll break out into like a yeasty rash maybe under your arms oh, yeah. or right under kind of where your any, anywhere you have a strap or a belt or things like that. Mm -hmm. So it treats yeast, so you can put a little bit of coconut oil there as well. So there are a lot of topical uses for coconut oil. And then internally we love coconut oil because it's one of those healthy fats and the research is catching up and showing that it really does help to balance gut bacteria. It helps to 
stabilize our appetite. So there are so many great uses for coconut oil. And it's cheap. It's really cheap and it's easy to find. And you could, so should you buy it sort of in the solid jar? Yes, it, comes? it okay. comes in like a round jar. It's solid typically. Yeah. You know, when you look at it, if you're, you know, you, in the summertime, the wonderful thing is it's so warm outside. So you can take it and it kind of melts in your hands right away. Mm -hmm. And then you can apply it to wherever you need to. Mm -hmm. In the winter, we're often heating it up a little bit to get that liquidy texture, but it's so versatile. I'll carry it when I travel. It's a makeup remover. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll use it to remove my eye makeup or mm -hmm. face makeup. So there's so many great ways to use it. I'm going to grab some. I'm going to try it. So we're chatting live with Dr. Taz. Uh, she is the founder of Center Spring MD. She's a specialist in holistic and integrative medicine. She's also a medical doctor. Um, I have a great one from Jill Brinkley Beinberg. She says, I'm gaining weight while I'm working out. Help in all caps. <laughs> I know how she feels. There's so many patients that come in and say that exact same thing to me. Mm -hmm. They are trying everything under the sun to lose weight mm -hmm. and it's not working out. And typically they think that, okay, I need to work out harder. So by the time they get to me, they are exhausted mm -hmm. and they are worn out from this whole effort. Again, I go back to it is 80% food and 20% working out. Mm -hmm. So I would advise her to look first at her food critically because mm -hmm. what we're understanding that a lot of weight and the gaining of weight begins with digestive health. Mm -hmm. And if that's not in the right place, it's really tough to lose weight no matter how much you work out. So I really feel for her. And at the same time, as she's looked at her food and she thinks she has that piece right, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what her age is, but even thinking about hormones, because, uh, you know, as women, our hormones really mess with our weight to a, you know, to a large extent as well. And mm -hmm. if their hormone shifts and she continues to gain weight, again, no matter how much she works out, it's, she, it's just self-defeating. So, so 80% food. 20% working out, and then for women in particular, think hormones, get your hormones checked because there could be a factor there. Okay, and then uh, switching subjects a little bit here, Deandra Foster says, what are some good uses for rosemary and peppermint oil? Those are two of my favorite oils, both mm -hmm. rosemary and peppermint. There's so many ways to use them. So rosemary, let's start with that one. Actually, I have it growing in our backyard. We use it all the time. Mm -hmm. So from a beauty standpoint, I love using rosemary because it gives a quick glow to your face if you steam with it. So I'll cut okay. a couple sprigs of rosemary, put it in hot water and just inhale that. Mm -hmm. But not only does it give you a glow, it will loosen congestion. So if you're fighting any type of sinus infection or allergies or mm -hmm. things like that, it helps just to kind of loosen all that stuff up, makes it much easier to breathe so that's a great use for it many people don't know but rosemary oil when you buy it in a tincture you know like an essential oil mm -hmm. rosemary oil is an antibacterial so you can apply it to things like mosquito bites or to you know maybe areas that got scraped and it helps those wounds to heal a little bit faster mm -hmm. peppermint oil on the other hand I love for a number of reasons and I use it the most you know when I travel and I recommend it to patients when they've got migraines or headaches you can take just a little bit of peppermint oil and kind of rub it right here into your temples when you have a headache mm -hmm. and that will often help to relieve a headache from travel or from a lack of sleep which is common in the summertime mm -hmm. peppermint oil also helps a little bit with indigestion and a little bit with nausea so you can inhale it and it'll calm that feeling of nausea down or you can even ingest a drop or two and it'll help a little bit with indigestion okay and in case you're just tuning in um, I'm Beth Galvin the Fox Medical Team reporter and I have Dr. Taz here who is from Center Spring MD and a specialist kind of in holistic and integrative medicine. She's been taking a lot of good questions here on Facebook and we would love for you to post your questions uh, for her. And then uh, somebody says, um, it, a lot of questions about coconut oil, your comments wow. earlier on <laughs> coconut oil. Um, and and one says that I, you know, I've heard that coconut oil may clog your pores on your face. Is that true? Please respond. That's Peggy Hawkins add that, add it, asking that. Peggy, I've heard that too, but coconut oil's pH actually, which again is kind of a measure of how acidic it is, actually really resembles our skin. So it doesn't clog our pores the way some other fats may if we tried to apply it directly to the skin. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have skin that's really irritated or broken out, I don't know that I would add a whole bunch of oil on top of that because we don't know how your skin's gonna react. But if you have sort of normal pH skin, meaning skin that's relatively blemish free, maybe a little bit dry, coconut oil should not clog your pores and should not make you break out. If you have a lot of, if you have what I call angry skin, it's really broken out, it's really red, then maybe you need to be a little bit careful with coconut oil. Okay, and so I'm taking some of your questions here that's why I'm looking at my phone Josh Wright asks of uh, Dr. Taz can I work out every day and eat what I want to yeah. eat 
<laughs> oh man, can I work out every day and eat what I want? You know what? You probably can, but it's still going to catch up with you. You can do it for a short period of time. Honestly, I go back to, I hate to keep saying this, but food, 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 food is medicine. And I feel like in our 20s, we could do that. You could go out, you could eat whatever you want. You could pull up to crystals and eat 20 crystals. You could do all that stuff and work out. But by your 30s, by your 40s, by your you. 50s, that formula for weight loss no longer works. And I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I uh, got another one here, an, an unrelated one. It's from Allie Edge. We talked a little bit about sunscreen before. She's asking, what do I look for sort of on the label to find the safest sunscreen? Because I hear so much about toxins in sunscreen. Yes. And that's kind of a tricky question because we kind of have it drilled to our, drilled into us by our doctors. You've got to wear sunscreen. sunscreen and right. then we hear these stories sort of in the news. Sunscreen may not be safe. How do you... Um, well, there are about seven or eight common chemicals that are used in sunscreens that are available over the counter. Mm -hmm. And it's really tough as parents or even for ourselves to figure out which ones to use. So your safest one is zinc. Mm -hmm. Zinc oxide is one of the safest ones. Titanium you know, dioxide is probably right after that. But then when you start going down the list, all the benzones, you'll see oxybenzone, avabenzone, you know, that word benzone, that's really not a safe chemical to be putting on ourselves or our children. So I usually have, you know, my patients avoid that particular chemical. So read mm -hmm. your labels is the mm -hmm. first tip and really try to understand what the chemicals are in your sunscreen. The second tip is, believe it or not, the sprays are worse from a toxic standpoint mm -hmm. than the creams or the lotions or things like that. So avoid the sprays because the aerosolizing of those chemicals, we think, has a higher toxic load and a higher burden on us. Okay. And finally, there's really no need to buy a sunscreen over an SPF of about 30. At anything after 30 is marketing. It's not really doing a whole lot. And typically, yeah. those products also have a lot more chemicals in it, too. Okay. So stick to a sunscreen about a, of about SPF 30 or below. You don't need anything higher than that. Okay. And how, how often should you be reapplying? We usually say for every hour of sun, you need to apply at least every 20 minutes or so. So okay. if you're out for an hour, come back and reapply. If you go out for an hour, come back and reapply. You know, okay. So. Okay. Um, Ella Daniel says, um, would need an idea on how to get my three-year-old daughter to eat more veggies. That's a common. That's a good one. Common question. <laughs> they won't just sit down and eat carrots yeah, and celery. Absolutely. And I guess like not. No, uh, that is a good one. So trying to get, and so, first of all, it's really important to get these young kids to eat their veggies because mm -hmm. we are establishing their taste buds for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So we want them to eat veggies. Some tricks are to puree them. So mm -hmm. you can cut them up, cut up whichever veggies you've got in the house, maybe steam them lightly, puree them, and you can store that pureed mixture in little baby jars and stick them in the fridge. And anytime you do anything, whether you're making a soup or a sauce, or you're doing a baked good, you can add that pureed, that small little amount of pureed vegetable into the mixture, and that's a great way to disguise it, and they never even know. Another great trick is to blend them. You know, make smoothies, make smoothies interesting. You know, and a lot of children will drink smoothies but won't eat vegetables. So blend up all your vegetables, yeah, blend up all your fruits and vegetables together and maybe add just a little bit of honey to it so it's a little sweet, mm -hmm. and that's another great way for them to do it. And I would say the third fun way is to you know, make it visually appealing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, turning it into little shapes or faces and then having fun, like little dressings by it. So they have to dip it, you know, they can dip in their favorite sauce or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of fun and it makes it interesting for kids. And then there's been a lot of recent stuff, Beth, where if children are involved in growing vegetables, mm -hmm. like they're out there on the patio and they're digging into the dirt and they're seeing like the carrots come or the tomatoes come or things like that, there's a lot more interest in eating those foods or trying those foods. So maybe this summer, if you have the time, start a little patio garden and put, you know, start to grow some vegetables with your children and see if that sparks some interest too. Yeah, and an herb garden is kind of something that's pretty easy that, it's that anybody can so do. So easy, no matter what space you're living in, you can have a tiny little herb garden, you can grow tomatoes on your deck, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very, very easy. And then uh, Brenda Wright Massey writes in, um, suggesting for Ella, she says, hide them in other foods like spaghetti yes. and yeah. mashed potatoes. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. another good yep. idea. Yep, yep, yep. Um, a lot of questions. What do you get questions about? Oh, wow. What do I get questions about? So it runs 
the spectrum. Yeah. From how do I eat healthy? Mm -hmm. How do I shop healthy? Mm -hmm. um, what is the best way to not get sick? That's a that's a common well, one. Let's start you know? there. Let's you try that one. I'll okay. take you on that one. Um, you know, so for a lot of people, you know, whether you're a traveler or you have a high stress job or you're a parent, you're mm -hmm. exposed to a lot of germs all the time. So mm -hmm. not getting sick is all about buffering your immune system. Mm -hmm. It starts with food. Lower your sugar. Really watch sugar. Sugar depletes the immune system dramatically. You know, eat consistently. Don't starve for long periods of time because that's a stress to the immune system as well. Mm -hmm. And then really work on getting foods high in vitamin C, high in antioxidants because they really boost and prime the immune system. So, you know, I'm thinking citrus fruits like, you know, your oranges and grapefruits and things like that, but even your greens like your kale and spinach, mm -hmm. all of those things play a role in supporting the immune system and preventing you from getting sick. After that, remember sleep. You know, no matter what you do, if you're not sleeping and, you know, we've all experienced this, if you go for a few nights of sleep, the next thing you know, you've caught everything around you. Sleep consistently, you know, sleep for at least eight to nine hours a night mm -hmm. because that determines the strength of your immune system. And then, you know, looking at your digestive health and making sure that's really where it needs to be without mm -hmm. getting into too much of the science, what we understand is that all the things you need to regulate your immune system are made in your belly. So right. if that belly is not doing what it needs to do, then it's gonna be really tough for you to have a strong immune system. I could keep going. I mean, there are, <laughs> I mean, there's, there are other things you could take as well but that help the immune system. I mean, I've talked about it before. We talked about astragalus and mm -hmm. probiotics and those things, and they help as well. But I mean, I think when I think ABC, long-term prevention, keeping the immune system where it needs to be, it's food, it's sleep, it's digestive health. Those are the tenets of a healthy immune system. And I know we, we um, probiotics are getting a lot more attention. Yeah. Um, and. I've always been told, you know, if you're taking an antibiotic, you need to take a probiotic. Mm -hmm. Do you take a probiotic? every day or, mm -hmm. um, and, and should you be taking one even if you're not taking antibiotics? I mean, what are the benefits of probiotics? They do look kind of expensive when you right. see them in the store. What, what do probiotics do? Um, are they a good investment and, you know, are they worth the price or is there an affordable option? So those are all great questions which continue honestly to be debated in the science. Mm -hmm. But what I have noticed clinically from day to day is that to answer your first question, not everybody needs to be on a probiotic. I'm mm -hmm. not going to say that. Probiotics, um, the, our patients that are on it are typically patients that have some level of immune system issues, they mm -hmm. have digestive issues, mm -hmm. they even have a little bit of sort of behavioral or neurological issues because mm -hmm. what we're understanding about the body is that the gut and the brain are connected. So again, trying to do whatever you can to keep those dots connected is critical. But the problem is, is that when we look at probiotics across the spectrum, they're not all equal. You know, some probiotics really are what they say they are, some are not. Mm -hmm. Some of them, by the time they get on the shelf and get into your hands, don't even have half the bacteria that they say they're gonna have. So for the consumer out there trying to figure out, first of all, do I need a probiotic? And secondly, which one do I buy? It really goes back to quality. You need to buy a high quality probiotic <laughs> if you're gonna go on one. Otherwise, it's better just not to be on one, honestly. You know, okay. so you wanna look at your labels, you wanna look at the certification that the company has chosen to go through and buy that and maybe spend a little bit more on a better product or don't buy the cheapest product that you find because often it is not what it says it is. And uh, one thing that one really good source of, of, of probiotics is um, Greek yogurt. Yes. So that you don't need a prescription no. for, you don't need to go yeah. to the health food store for. And that's been really exciting I think in the last you know probably couple of years is that there's so many great probiotic rich foods you know you don't have to be dependent on a probiotic pill mm -hmm. you know there's not just yogurt you know but there's things like kefir you mm -hmm. know which is a relative of yogurt but has a lot of good healthy bacteria in it it's an old drink from Russia mm -hmm. but now has come back in vogue bone broth you know again back from Chinese medicine Ayurvedic medicine from those times now rich in bacteria has tons tons and tons of healthy bacteria in it, so it's nature's probiotic, you know? Yeah. And varying your food gets the right bacteria in you, because remember, you know, in the, in the olden days, we ate seasonally, we ate locally, we were getting different bacteria all the time, so we didn't need probiotics, but today that's not happening, and our guts are kind of all static. They don't, they don't get any challenge, they don't get any change, hence the need for probiotics. Okay, well, so I am uh, Beth Galvin, and we are live in the Digital Center talking to Dr. Taz uh, from Center Spring Medicine and we're answering some of your questions about just how to stay healthy on a budget and she's a 
great resource if you have been listening in or if you're just joining us. We're taking your questions on Facebook right now. And uh, I, I answer that because Ricky Gibbons writes in, what am I watching? <laughs> <laughs> you're watching Beth and Dr. Taz. Um, and so uh, one, one interesting one that I saw uh, coming up on the feed here asking questions was something about eczema. How do you mm -hmm. deal, um, this is um, Tanya Bridges Middlebrooks, and she says, what helps with eczema? That's such a frustrating Yes, disorder. it is frustrating. Um, Tanya, there's so much you can do for eczema, but I want to start with one thing that I, I want you to understand is that eczema, what we have found is again connected to digestive health. I feel like I'm repeating myself a little mm -hmm. bit, but so much is connected to digestive health. But eczema is very much connected, and sometimes there is a food reason for you to have constant eczema. So just be thinking about that and maybe following your diet to kind of track your flares. If you know you've had a bad flare, think back to what you ate maybe the three days prior and see if there's any connection there. There may not be. But after that, you know, a deficiency of great fat, like good healthy fats, is a reason to have eczema. Eczema is a breakdown of the skin barrier. So getting those healthy fats in again is really critical to healing the skin from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And then topically, there's some great things that you can do. Calendula, which is an herbal product, mm -hmm. you know, you can apply that topically to help with eczema. You can take evening primrose oil, which is another herb herb. It's used in a lot of different ways. The capsules are usually available over the counter, but you can cut those in half and rub those directly onto the areas that you have eczema, and oftentimes that will help too. And the same thing we've talked about with aloe vera. If you've got real red, angry eczema, you can take aloe vera, make your own tinctures at home. You can take aloe vera, add a little bit of evening primrose oil to it, mix it up together, and apply it, and it'll help soothe the skin and repair that skin barrier. Okay, and uh, lots of people weighing in on eczema, asking yeah. about that. Um, Kimberly Kanga says, uh, how do you feel about cardio? Because some people say it's too stressful on the heart, and if you, you know, if you, especially if you're sweating a lot and really working hard, and it's hot out right now, mm -hmm. is walking better? Is all cardio equal? So all cardio is not equal, and this is where kind of really getting individualized care is so important because mm -hmm. Walking is the right form of exercise for anybody with joint issues or anyone with severe heart disease that's not well controlled right now. But walking is not the right exercise for somebody with insulin regulation issues where you have a lot of abdominal weight or you ha might have diabetes or some of those type of diseases. You really need to work the heart. You really need to increase that heart rate at least 10 beats per minute, you know? Mm -hmm. So really learning to track your heart rate, I think is critical because it'll also help you with when you might be getting in trouble. You know, if you find that you start an exercise routine and from your resting heart rate, you're going way up, you know, you're going, your heart rate's rising by over 50 counts or so. Mm -hmm. That, that might be too tough of a workout for you. Mm -hmm. So again, I would say vary your workouts, stick to walking if you have any injuries, if you have any long-standing chronic disease, but do some cardio that really challenges your heart otherwise. Okay, and we have, a, we have uh, time for a few more questions. Um, we are live with Dr. Taz. Um, she is a specialist in integrative and uh, holistic medicine from Center right. Spring mm -hmm. MD here in Atlanta. Um, somebody is asking about, Marnie Williams is asking about the benefits of drinking coconut water. Mm -hmm. Is it more hydrating in the summer? In the sun. In the sun. So the benefit of coconut water is that it's a, an electrolyte replacer. Basically, mm -hmm. it's probably nature's version of Gatorade is the way I would think about it. So, you know, if you're out there and you're sweating and you're doing a lot of sports and your children are in camps, it's great because there is a replacement of electrolytes that we would not have with just regular water. So that's okay. the benefit. Okay. Do you drink it? I do. I you do, do drink okay. coconut water, yes. Okay. Definitely do. Um, Don Holland asks, have you ever heard of a program called the 21 Day Fixed? It's a balanced diet, a 30 minute workout every day. I love it. I've lost 80 pounds. Happy to tell anybody and help them with their own journey. Now you've written uh, you've written a book. The well, belly. we did the 21 Day Belly Fix, which right. is a little bit different from the 21 Day Fix. I'm familiar with it. You know, I'm all for if a plan works for you, go for it stick to it and see if it can help others. The 21 day belly fix was more, mm -hmm. um, the 21 day belly fix was more about digestive health and how digestive health really resets weight loss. The 21 day fix is, has the element of, of cardio and all that other stuff involved too. Okay, I'm gonna have you flip your hair yeah, back there off the mic. The yeah, mic. Oh, sorry um, guys. So, um, let's see. Um, Helly Gregerson says, what to do about candida? Okay, that's a big one. <laughs>
<laughs> Where do we start? <laughs> All right, candida. A lot of people might not even know what candida is. Candida is an overgrowth of yeast, basically, in the gut. Mm -hmm. It can also be topical. That's the skin rashes we were talking about a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So getting rid of candida, number one thing is lower sugar. You know, sugar feeds candida, dairy feeds candida. So really lowering both sugar in and dairy both are critical in managing candida. Okay. Then the second step is worrying about your digestive health, because we all have candida to a certain extent, but it's when candida overgrows that it becomes a real issue. So, you know, taking probiotics, that's a role for probiotics there. You know, doing things like apple cider vinegar and water, that mm -hmm. will help to kind of minimize candida also. And then there are a lot of natural herbs, grapefruit seed extract is one of them, mm -hmm. berberine is one. These are things that help to kill an overgrowth of candida in your gut. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm looking at my phone because we're getting so many oh, good questions goodness. on Facebook, but Natasha, Matthews says, um, I see all the time items at the store that say zero calories on the bottle, but it's not water. Are these drinks good for you? Are they really zero calories? So I'm going to, let's see. So it depends on the drink, but I'm going to give you a blanket no. They're <laughs> typically not good for you because they usually are diet sodas or diet drinks of some kind mm -hmm. or drinks that have been modified to be zero calories. So I'm going to say no. I would look at them with a lot of suspicion and read your labels carefully to really understand the ingredients that are in there. Okay, so we have time for a couple more mm -hmm. questions. Okay, okay. Yeah. so we're live with Dr. Taz from Center Spring MD. She's a specialist in alternative medicine and she's also a medical doctor and she is a huge resource of just all kinds of information um, on how to stay healthy and how to be healthy. And so Karen Kelly is posting on Facebook. She's asking, what do you believe is a healthy A1C level? Talk about That's what an A1C level is and, and answer her question. Yeah, if you I mean, can, we, Dr. Taz. We, we routinely check A1C levels in the practice. And an A1C level is basically about a three month interpretation of your blood sugar levels, really trying to understand where your blood sugar levels have averaged over the course of the last three months. Mm -hmm. So a healthy A1C level for me is going to be right around 5.4 or 5.5. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want you any higher than that. And sometimes I don't even want you lower than that because it tells me that you, know, you may be dropping too low at certain points. But that's about where I usually like to see my patients and that's usually what we aim for. Okay. Um, we have, um, so, I think it's Soladin is how you say it, um, is asking starches, healthy yeah. or not? Starch, it depends on the starch. You know, you can't make them all bad guys and you can't make them all good guys. It really depends on the starch. You know, complex carbs have a space in our plates. You know, many, many patients avoid them completely and the side effects of avoiding a complex carb completely, like a sweet potato or quinoa or some or even whole grains, the problem with avoiding them completely is that we need a little bit to manage our neurotransmitters and to manage our mental health and our gut health. So some starches are good and they're needed, but the excess is not needed. And that's where our country has gotten into so much trouble is that everything has added starch. Every processed, packaged, fast, refined food that you can find is a starch-based food, you know, mm -hmm. because it's cheap and it's quick and it's easy to produce. So that's where we've gotten into trouble. So I think we, we go from extremes, it seems like in the diet world, you know, we go from all starch is good to all starch is bad to whole grains are good and whole grains are bad. It's really just moderation and understanding that we need some starch in our diet to manage our neurotransmitters and things like that. We just don't need the excess. Okay. Um, so we're getting some questions. We're sitting live in our um, digital newsroom here at Fox 5 Atlanta with Dr. Taz. Um, and we're getting more questions. That's why I'm looking at my phone. <laughs> I know. Um, you've got a, uh, you've got questions a about the paleo diet um, from Emma. Linda asks, do you recommend the Atkins diet? Um, those are both phenomenally popular. Right. So those are both fad diets that have come on the scenes at different points, you know, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. So mm -hmm. Atkins diet, do I recommend it? Absolutely not. Paleo diet d is a fit for certain people. Again, diets have to be matched individually. The problem with the Atkins diet is they got it right when they talked about protein and fat. They did mm -hmm. get that part right. Mm -hmm. But the fat that they chose was a lot of saturated fat, mm -hmm. which for some people, again, it's your genetics. If you've got the genetics of heart disease or diabetes, that saturated fat is a problem, you know, in excess. You know, mm -hmm. it was a lot of meat and a lot of, you know, um, a lot of like butter and things like that, which in small amounts are necessary and large amounts for 
for certain people can be deadly, you know. Mm -hmm. The paleo diet is wonderful. I'm a huge fan of it personally. It's a diet that really fits me. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not the diet for everyone. There are people who have trouble with high amounts of meat, you know, that call, that are called for in paleo. Mm -hmm. So again, diets ultimately, and that's what's so hard about all of this, is that diets really need to be individualized to the medical conditions you're dealing with, to your genetics, and that's where everyone needs a little bit of guidance and help into which way to turn. Do they need more fat? Do they need more protein? Do they need more grain? Mm -hmm. You know, what do they need? The safest diet, sort of the landing pad is what I call it for everyone, if they don't have the time and energy to really dig into all these details, is the anti-inflammatory, like a Mediterranean diet, you know, where you're right. getting a decent amount of a healthy fat, you're getting the protein, and you're getting all those great fruits and vegetables as well. Is the, is the internet a good source for that and trying to find something that fits your personality or how do you choose something that's going to fit your lifestyle? The internet is probably not the best source to figure out individual diets. Okay. I really think you need to sit with nutritionists or physicians who are well versed on that topic mm -hmm. to understand the details of that individuality. Mm -hmm. The internet is an amazing source and there's some amazing apps even out there on trying to put a paleo diet together for yourself or trying to put the Mediterranean diet together for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there's some good books, you know, I talk about Dr. Weil all the time. He's written some great books on the Mediterranean diet. The What Doctors Eat, which is a book I, I wrote a few years back, that's an anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet. So there are great books on, on those diets but really trying I feel like I feel my patients frustration honestly I feel everyone's frustration when they come in and they're like I don't know whether to be paleo or Atkins or vegan or raw or, <laughs> or well, yeah I don't know what to do here yeah and so food becomes this landmine for everybody that it really should not be you know um, yeah we're just getting tons of questions here on Facebook from people asking about different diets and how to customize them right so you would really recommend either going to a nutritionist or a registered dietitian or to your doctor or to uh, you know the library maybe to I think so, and then, you know, again, we're trying to develop more tools. There's some things that are subtle, right? First of all, you can look at your body type. That's one quick quick tool. So if you're somebody who gains weight a lot in the middle, mm -hmm. you need a high-protein diet. You mm -hmm. need a diet that manages insulin. So paleo may be a little bit of a fit there. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're somebody instead that gains weight in the lower half of your body, then that's a different diet completely, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're somebody in, who has, like, a lot of cholesterol issues, then more of a vegetarian or even slightly vegan diet is, is the right fit there. So I think it's really really matching, you know, trying to match to the best of your ability, your symptoms, your medical history with the way you should eat. And I know it's challenging, but I think sticking to an anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet is probably the best bet. Okay, so we have a couple more minutes here and we are live in the Fox 5 Digital Newsroom with Dr. Taz from Center Spring MD. She's a specialist in holistic and integrative medicine. She's also a medical doctor um, with a practice here in Atlanta. Um, uh, it says, um, Crystal Deco asks, you know, you talked about probiotics earlier. Yes. That's been a popular one here uh -huh. in the questions and the comments. What do I need to look for in a good probiotic besides the price? Because there are just so many to choose from. I know some have to be refrigerated. Mm -hmm. um, That's a great question. So the number one thing I would look for on that label is how do they describe their product? It should be described in something called CFUs, which are colony forming units. And it should be very clear that there are at least 20 billion colony forming units. That's my criteria, the first one to look for. The second one is it should be really clear about how many different strains of bacteria are in there, mm -hmm. like what bacteria are there and what amounts, and it should be nicely laid out. And then the third is look for certifications. There's something called the GMP certification that has a stamp that you can look for on a supplement bottle. Mm -hmm. There's a USP certification. You can look for that stamp on a bottle. But those stamps tell you that that company voluntarily submitted their product for testing. Finally, the question about refrigerated or not refrigerated, I mean, that's a huge debate. You know, ideally, the refrigerated ones are thought to last a little bit longer because remember, those bacteria sitting in that bottle degrade the longer they're sitting on the shelf, meaning they're not quite as many there as there may have been two weeks ago or three weeks ago. So the ones that are refrigerated maybe hold that shelf life stability a little bit longer, so are better bets. But again, if their labels aren't clear, then they're just as ineffective as another shell, another one that's not refrigerated where the label is very clear. So labels are my first, I mean, that, that's my first one. Look at the label, look at the label, look at the label. That's my first one. <laughs> okay. So we have time for maybe one or two more questions and I'm getting multiple questions on um, anything that's helpful for people with MS. 
MS is an autoimmune disease, and that's probably the main thing to remember. Mm -hmm. MS is a disease of inflammation. It is a tough disease. It presents in so many different ways in our practice, everything from just mild pain to people that really can't walk and are having a lot of difficulty. You know, for all of those patients, as I watch them kind of on the journey of that disease, it is all about inflammation, and it's all about controlling inflammation and turning that immune system around, turning that immune system around from reacting against you to really working with you. So the way we treat our MS patients is, again, it begins with gut health and trying to slow down the inflammatory process. It also begins with something called the mitochondria, where you're trying to strengthen all those muscular cells that are in each muscle, give a lot of oxygen to that. So it's diet that helps with that, definitely. And then there's some supplements that help with that, too. Um, so that's kind of our overall approach to it, is to really think inflammation, target inflammation, and then make that conversation individual for every patient. Okay, well I wanna say thank you so much You're to welcome. Dr. Taz for, for taking the time to sit with us to talk, you know, yeah. for the last few minutes. I learned a lot. I think all of you learned a lot. We are uh, live in the Fox 5 digital newsroom. I'm Beth Galvin with Dr. Taz from Center Spring MD, and we really enjoyed this chat both on YouTube and Facebook. And um, if you do have questions, you can go ahead. Dr. Taz does have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com um, backslash Dr. Taz, and Taz is spelled T-A-Z. So facebook.com backslash Dr. Taz. She will be able to answer some of your questions later in the day if you have them. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's, but we had some great questions here today. Good conversation. And I really enjoyed, this is our first chat we're doing in our new digital uh, newsroom here at Fox 5, and it's been a lot of fun, and it's been a pleasure to Thank have you, you. and uh, to, you. to talk with Good you for a questions. while. Good questions. You guys are tough crowd we can't questions. wait to have you back and do this again yeah we'll definitely so thank you very much enjoy your afternoon and enjoy your weekend and stay out of the heat